skin. Oh, cool. Is it good? Nice. No hiccups today. There we go. I meant to come in a few minutes early just to make sure that whatever weirdness happened last week didn't happen this week. Um, but it looks like we were good. So we'll just chit chat in here. I forgot to put my live thing on, so I still can't see what anybody's saying if they're saying anything. I don't think I can see it on this on this anyways. Oh. It's only on over there. Um, Janie Coulter from Manitonis, Manitoba says hi. Hi. Janie. Janie, hi. June Hansen from Iowa. Hi, June. Rebecca James from St. Louis. Hey, Rebecca. Julie Knight, Illinois. Hey, Julie. Dina Hill says hello. Hey, Dina. Maya Lokoff from Melbourne, Australia. Good morning. <gasps> Good morning, sunshine. Your weather's getting warmer now, right? Because ours is getting colder. Uh, Mona Philpots from Lundy, BC. Hey, Mona. Lucy Greenwald from Maine. Awesome. Hi, Lucy. That's good. We'll give it a few minutes because we are just a, a smidge early. Like I said, I just wanted to get in here a little bit early just to make sure that whatever happened last week didn't happen again this week. I still don't know. I didn't get an answer from these people. <laughs> these, these, um, the thing that I'm using to do these streaming things, they, they couldn't really give me an answer as to why it happened the way it did. So anyway, hopefully, hopefully that was a one-off and it doesn't happen again. So... We're going to talk about rulers today. We're going to talk about the basics of rulers. So as long as you get the basics down, then the sky's the limit. It's the basics that are the most important thing, though. Does anybody have, um, does anybody do ruler work for those of you who are, are here? Oh, sorry. that's okay. Are you watching TV? <laughs> Lydia's here. <laughs> Apparently, she's watching TV. I'm not. <laughs> My friend Jesse's in the chat as well, so um, he'll be there for support and clicking links or whatever magic he does while he's here. I couldn't do this without either two, either of these two. I'll tell you. I'm already trying to man four cameras by myself. <laughs> Are we good? What's the matter? I'm not volume drop on my phone. Oh, you can just turn it down. Okay. It's eight o'clock. Should we get started? I think we should get started. Anybody who comes in, they can just um, they can just click in wherever we uh, wherever we are at the time, and that'll be good. Okay, so we're going to talk about ruler work. We're going to talk about the basics of ruler work. So, uh, basic ruler safety, um, some things that you are imperative to working with rulers, uh, some things that you know come with time, all that kind of stuff. The first thing I want to mention about ruler work, and in tonight's thing, we're talking about long arms, so stand-up machines on frames. If you're on a domestic machine, uh, the rules may be different for you because it's, you're, you know, you're moving your paper around underneath your pen rather than on a long arm. Standing up, we're moving our pen across our paper, right? Um, <clears throat> so the most important thing you need to remember with a long arm, and it doesn't matter what uh, brand of long arm you have, you absolutely must, must, must have uh, an extended ruler base 
on your machine before you start using rulers. Honestly, I don't care if you're going that far with a ruler that big, make sure your extended ruler base is on there. It's just, it's dangerous. Don't try to do it without one, all right? The beds of our long arms, again, no matter what brand, are narrow and you cannot balance a ruler of any size on a throat this wide, okay? We want a nice flat surface so that our rulers will sit flat and not teeter-totter, okay? So, now I have oodles of camera angles here. I'm hoping you can see this if I bring it all the way down to here. So, this is the one for APQS machines. Each brand will have, you'll have your own, um, your manufacturer will uh, have their own line of them to fit your to fit your machines. Ours are a clear acrylic, uh, and they just slide right on. So I just slide it on. It goes underneath my hopping foot there, and it lays into place. Okay. So now I've got this nice flat surface. So when I do lay a ruler down, I've got somewhere for it to sit and somewhere for it to balance. Okay. Most important thing. I'm going to put my clamps on. The next thing is the requirements for the rulers. On a stand up long arm, you must use acrylic that is a quarter of an inch thick. Okay? On the sit-down machines, I know that there's a different size. I know there's a company called Westley that um, makes rulers for domestic machines. I don't know a lot about rulers for domestic machines, and I know there's different shanks and all that kind of stuff. But on a, on a stand-up long arm or a sit-down long arm, uh, the acrylic has to be a quarter of an inch thick. Okay? If it's thinner than that, you are going to run the risk for sure of your hopping foot coming up and over the ruler and uh, catching on it, your ruler will get underneath. So they've got to be a quarter inch thick, okay? With rulers, some people like to slide, some people like rulers to stick, and some like them to like really stick or kind of stick and kind of slide. So, depending on the ruler that I'm using, I have different preferences for everything. If I'm stitching with circles, I, I really like that circle to hold on to my fabric so it's not sliding around. When I'm stitching in the ditch, I actually like to kind of slide my ruler along with me. After I get warmed up a little bit, I like to slide it. it I find it easier. Um, so, there's different products. I don't know all of the products. I just know the ones that I have experience with, okay? So without one, it's kind of like your cutting rulers. If you don't have anything on the ruler, it's really, they're really slippery. And depending what you're doing, um, it could be dangerous if they're, if they're slip sliding all the way. So it's nice to have something on them. I know some rulers come with a texture and that on the back as well. I don't have a lot of experience with those, so I really can't say anything about that. All the rulers I have, all the rulers I've sold, um, they're all just flat. They're just, just acrylic on both sides. It's the same thing. So I've come up with a couple of different things that I, that I like to use. The first thing, and I've been using this probably the longest, it's, uh, it's called Incredible Tape, actually. And it's just a thin, clingy vinyl. It comes in a roll. It's like, I don't know, $4 or something. It's actually meant for wrapping cords. Seals boxes, wraps threads, stu uh, spools, keeps luggage closed. It does all kinds of stuff. Um, I stuck it on the back of a cutting template years and years ago. I worked at a quilt shop and I was doing flying geese and I had a flying geese uh, thing, template and it kept sliding and I kept messing up my cuts. And I was looking around for something to make it grab. And I grabbed a roll of this and stuck a piece on the back and what a game changer. So then I took it home and I started putting it on the back of my long arm rulers. I like it because it, 
it helps it stick just a little bit. It's, it gives it a little bit of grip, but it doesn't stick and it still allows me to slide. Okay, so I like that product. The other thing you can use is, um, this is called So Tacky, uh, So Tacky Technology. It's a rubber strip. It's um, military grade rubber and it's quite sticky. And you put it on the backs of your rulers and it, and it grips, just sticks to the fabric. And then as the lint and all that kind of stuff starts to build up on it and it loses its stick, you're meant to wash it with uh, warm soap or warm water and soap like Dawn dish soap or spray nine or anything like that you can put on it and you just rub it gently with the with the pad of your finger don't dig your nails into it just rub it with the pads of your fingers and all the lint will come off and you rinse it and it dries and it's sticky again so that stuff's really cool um, I've used it for a long time and then the newest thing which I'm in love with is this grippy stuff it's a non-slip coating and I seem to be the last person to hear about this stuff, so I don't get out much, clearly. <laughs> um, one of my customers asked me to bring it into the shop because she uses it and she loves it. You can use it on your cutting rulers when you're, when you're piecing in that, but you can also spray it on your long arm rulers. So I've been spraying it on everything. I've sprayed it on my rulers. I've also sprayed it on the backs of my stencils, my plastic stencils, and it really helps the stencils stick to the fabric so that when you pounce with your chalk pounce, the stencil doesn't slip. So this stuff's really cool. Uh, you can put it, you know, just a thin layer is good. Uh, if you put it too thick, it will cloud up the rulers a little bit. Um, that doesn't bother me, to be honest, because I'm, I'm not using these increments for anything. I don't know if you can see that in the camera. It's just a little cloudy, but I probably just sprayed way too much. But it doesn't bother me. I don't care. So it's all good. It, it gives you a really, a really good stick. That's not sliding anywhere. It doesn't leave any residue or anything on the fabric, um, but it really holds that, that template in place, which for circles is really what I want. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so different things do different products give you different amounts of grip or grab. So just experiment. If you have a favorite, let me know. Um, if there's something that you use that I haven't heard of, that's quite possible. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, so on this one, I've got my, my vinyl. And the thing I like about this incredible tape, I can pull it off here and stick it to a different ruler. Now, I'm not one to be very frugal. I mean, I'll just rip off miles of it. Um, but it is kind of good that it just comes off and you can stick it somewhere else. You don't need tons. This little ruler's only got two pieces, one here and one here, and it holds it, it holds it just good enough. Okay. If anybody is gonna ask me, has anybody asked where I got this yet? This tray? This is the best tray. There's no affiliation. I, I don't work for Amazon. It's just, I bought this on Amazon and it's actually for a bathtub, but it's adjustable. So it'll fit, it'll fit really any size frame. It goes right down to, oops, I lost a bobbin. Doesn't matter, it's okay. And you can open it up and it's rubber on the bottom because it's meant for a bathtub and you can put it right on top of your rollers and have all your stuff right in there. And then everything's easy to reach if and when you want it. I don't need any of this now, so I'll get rid of all that. They have different ones on Amazon. I just got the white one because I just thought it would look cleaner in the shop. They've, I know they've got bamboo ones and all. Who puts bamboo in a bathtub? Sorry. Squirrel. Had a moment. Okay. If you are new to rulers, you maybe just got your long arm or you just have long armed for a long time and you really don't have any experience with rulers. 
the, the biggest thing I can teach you tonight is to, the most important thing is that you always need control of the ruler wherever you're stitching, okay? So start with, the easiest way to get into the habit of that is to start with a ruler that's not much bigger than your wingspan. Generally, we start with straight rulers because the first thing we think of when we start doing ruler work is stitching in the ditch, right? If you're using rulers, it means you're doing custom work, and if you're doing custom work, you should be stitching in the ditch first. Before you do all the fancy stuff, you should be locking those ditches down and keeping everything straight and square and stable and all that kind of stuff before you start. So start with a ruler that's not too big. When I've got my, when I've got my fingers spread, I, have, I can reach both ends. I have total control of that ruler the whole time. All right, so that's where we're gonna start. Now, I've got my, uh, my extended ruler base on here, and I'm gonna start with this ruler. It's just, I don't know, it's three by seven or something, and it's got um, quarter inch increments and 45 degree angle increments. So it's got a few different things on it you can do. But a simple straight ruler is a great place to start, okay? I'm going to flip over and we're going to do this one and this one, I think. There we go. So the first thing I want to show you is just something simple. This uh, square is just meant to be squares. We're going to do something different in each one. Um, we're going to start with just a half an inch echo in here with a quarter inch echo inside it. There's uh, lots of times where you might want to make a block smaller or a border smaller or a sashing smaller so that you can um, fit some stuff into it if it's a little too big for the design you want to do. And the easiest way to do that is to shorten it up by doing some ruler work. So I have an X in the middle of my square this is automatically going to give me my, um, my increment lines. I'm going to use the lines on the ruler. These are a quarter an inch apart. And my foot is a half an inch round and my needle is in the middle. So no matter where I am with my ruler on my foot, my needle is a quarter of an inch away from my foot, okay? So if I put my ruler here with my quarter inch line, right on my stitching line, which we're going to pretend is my ditch, that's actually going to give me a stitching line that's a half an inch away from the edge of the block, okay? You'll have to use your imaginations for a minute because it's not pieced. So I'm going to line up my ruler with the quarter inch line sitting right on top of that stitching, and I'm going to position my ruler, or my foot, sorry, right on the chalk line. Lift my needle up. I'm going to do a couple of up and down stitches. Swing my thread around until it locks. That'll be good. And again, I'm going to position my line so that it's sitting on top of there and I'm just going to come straight down. Now, watch my hand. My fingers are spread. I don't honestly like to have my hand flat. I like my fingers spread and up. I'm pretty close to the outside edge of the ruler. I'm not hanging my fingers over, but I'm not back here. If my fingers are back here, I have zero control of this ruler and it will end up under here and you are gonna have a problem, okay? And for those of you who have not broken a needle on a ruler, I'm gonna tell you, first time it happens to you, it's going to scare the life out of you. So let's avoid that by keeping our fingers nice and close to the edge so that we have control. Personally, I start inside the edge of the ruler and I stop inside the edge. I don't like to start right on the end because if my hand slips, my ruler's going to slip off that foot and that's going to cause a problem. Okay? So I'm lined up. Start my machine. And I'm basically just running, I'm pulling the machine towards me till I hit that chalk line. 
and I'm just putting a little bit of pressure against the ruler and I'm holding the ruler steady so they're sort of just kind of pushing together the foot and the ruler. Change my angle. I'm going to line myself up again. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to run. I've got my fingers spread. I have control where the ruler's going to hit. And now I'm going to drag it to the right, but I'm sort of pulling it towards me again a little bit so it stays against the ruler. You don't want to fall off the ruler. And it doesn't, it's not too much of an issue when you're using a straight ruler, but when you start moving into curves, then it can get a little sticky. And with circles, you're probably, at the very least, first couple of times, you're going to fall off that circle somewhere. Up. And then across. So I'm going to hold my ruler like this. There we go. Total control of the ruler everywhere we go. A couple of lock stitches. I'm not going to worry about locking it perfectly at the moment because I just want to. I just want to show you. So now I have my my ruler against the stitching, the green stitching, because all I want now is a quarter of an inch echo. Okay. Same thing. My fingers are spread. They're up. I'm putting pressure on the ruler. Now. If you're putting pressure on your ruler and you're stitching and you're finding your machine is really hard to move, you're pushing too hard on your ruler. We want to push down hard enough on it that it stays where it is, but if, you're, if you've got you know, all your strength pushing that down so it doesn't move, you're going to make it almost impossible to pull your machine towards you because you're actually pushing on the bed of the machine. Okay. As I bring this towards me, my foot is now my guideline. So as soon as the front of my foot hits that uh, stitching, I know that I'm exactly a quarter of an inch away from here. Line up the edge of my ruler with my stitching. Bring it over. And as soon as my foot hits that green stitching there, I know I'm exactly a quarter of an inch away. up till the back of my foot hits that stitching. And then you can put your ruler behind if you're comfortable. This is a little far away. You shouldn't be stretching. Okay? When you're doing ruler work, it should be right in front of you. There should be no stretching out, trying to reach things or anything like that. That's when accidents happen. Okay? There we go. So that just gives you an echo there. I came in a half an inch from the edge because I wanted an actual, I wanted you to actually see that this was meant to be separate from out here. And then the quarter of an inch gives it that nice finished echo and you can fill that in with whatever you want. Any kind of freehand or whatever it is you're doing. Make sense so far? Hopefully, it, this is not like uh, watching paint dry. We'll see. So, if we're stitching in the ditch or doing any kind of ruler work um, where we need to move the ruler across, say a cross hatching, this ruler on a diagonal is not large enough, obviously, right? Because it doesn't go all the way to the end. If your space is chalked out, it's not going to matter because you're just going to be following your chalk lines. If it's not chalked and you're going to be using the registration lines on your ruler, you are going to have to use a ruler that's a little bit bigger. Okay, so we're going to do um, a cross hatch on this, on this block here. I'm just going to move my thing up a little bit. Just to about there. Can everybody see okay? Can you let me know? Make sure if, if the angles or the double screen or whatever is. Um, I do have a question for Anne. Sure. Um, she said, on your third turn, it looks very awkward to hold. Can you change hands? I'm left handed. Does that make a difference? 
Oh, I'm left-handed too. Um, I'm used to that position. What, what was your name again? I'm sorry. Anne. Anne. Anne said that this looked awkward. It is awkward a little bit. I am all for changing, um, putting your hand on the other side. I like it this way because I'm trying to see that increment. Um, but if you're comfortable holding it with an opposite hand, then, you know, go for it. As long as you're comfortable and you have control of the ruler, right? Everybody's different. I'm left-handed too, and I, and I find that for those of us who are left-handed, we have a little bit of a leg up than our right-handed friends because we've had to adapt. We've always had to adapt um, and use our other hand quite often. So yeah, if you're comfortable, absolutely, absolutely. I'm going to turn my top light off. I hope you can still see because the light's shining off my ruler and I'm going to have a hard time seeing it. So here we're going to do, I'm just going to do a one inch cross hatch. It's going to be exactly the same, um, the same method, whether it's a quarter inch, a half an inch, a two inch, whatever. I'm just going to use the lines of, um, the lines that are already on my ruler. This particular one is, uh, it's a grid work ruler. So it's, it's quite long. I'm still only going to stitch where I have control of the ruler. Okay. I've got, a uh, 30 degree and a 60 degree angle on here. So I'm going to line up this angle here with my stitching, which puts my ruler on its edge on an angle. I've got the three quarter inch line. So one, two, three, I've got that point right there is sitting right on this bottom corner because I've got the three quarters plus the quarter for my foot. This is going to give me one inch increments. Okay, so I'm going to line that up there with that line straight across here because we want to go in the straight line. And then I'm going to put my ruler against my foot and lift my bobbin. Okay. So I'm going to hold on to that and just drag it down. We're going to sneak in the ditch. Now we're basically going to move over about an inch. So when you first start this, it may take you a couple of times to go across to kind of gauge how far you have to go. But once you've been at it for a little bit, it will start to come quickly. At first, it's always a bit of a warm up, getting that spacing in your head where you can eyeball it. There we go. I'm on there now. So I know you probably can't see it, but I've got my three quarter inch line on my stitching line that I just did. And I'm just going to drive my machine backwards. I'm going to travel back. I, I need to go about an inch. So I'll go a little further and then drop my needle down or drop my ruler down. And of course now I went too far. So we're just going to come back a smidge and that's good there. Drag it across. Now watch my fingers. I've got my fingers spread. I've got lots of ruler over here and lots of ruler over here. When I get to here, I'm going to lose control where my thumb is. So I'm going to leave my ruler there and I'm just going to move my fingers a little bit. So I still have control of this corner. If your hand is up here and you're stitching down here, look what's happening. Okay. It won't end well. Too far. It always takes a while for me to get my, my groove with my spacing and we just work our way up. Let's see. Nope. Not far enough. Ruler works not fast either. So, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to get into it and start doing it, it's beautiful, but you have to be patient, pa be patient with yourself. It takes a while to get confident with the rulers and comfortable, but it's not a quick thing at all. It's not meant to be. 
but man, is it ever effective. There we go. And then if I wanted to come back this way, I'm going to come out here. I'm going to come down my ditch. And I would go the opposite way. And I'm not going to do the whole block because I don't want you all falling asleep on me. Although I'm starting to have fun, so I'm quite happy to stay here. And it's the same thing. So I'm going to line up my three quarter inch line with the bottom right there. And then I start coming this way. And I always want to be going backwards because then my hand is in front of me. I'm not trying to come this way with my hand at the back. That can get a little awkward. And if you're comfortable, you can also slide like this once you get once you get comfy, you can just kind of slide and tweak it and watch the line come up. Making sense so far? Are they still awake? I hope so. <laughs> there we go. I want to just do a couple more lines so you can see how good it looks. But we won't do the whole block. We only have just over an hour, so there's other things I want to do. But see how I'm moving my fingers across? Ah! Uh, on the floor. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. There we go. So we'll stop there. I just wanted you to be able to see that. And see we're getting a nice diamond, we're getting a nice diamond grid. All right, stick with me, I, I need to finish it. I can't leave it like that. It's bugging, it'll bug me if I don't finish it. So when we're done, I'm just gonna show you some pictures of um, some ruler work that I've got hanging around in the shop here, just so you can see how cool it can be. Now, right here, this is a good point here. See that little tiny line I just did? It seems so inconsequential, but if I didn't do that tiny little line, it would actually look like something is missing. So even those tiny little bits because it needs to look like it's falling out of the square. Okay? That looks good, hey? Hopefully you can see it all right. Would you like a few more questions? Yeah, sure, go ahead. That's okay. If you've never used rulers before, just start with stitching in the ditch. I just want you to get comfortable. Um, a great way to practice is, uh, you know those panels that look like they're pieced? You can, you can find them, I'm sure. Um, either they look like they've got blocks. Those are great ways to practice your, your ditch work. And you can practice echoing and do all that kind of stuff without having the um, without having to have pieced anything first, so there's not a lot of commitment. You can just throw down a panel. You can also just do some grid, um, uh, pounce down some chalk with a one inch square grid, and just, just follow the lines if you've never used rulers. Get used to holding it going left to right, right to left, down and up on a diagonal, because when you're actually working with your rulers on a quilt, 
and you're doing, you know, whatever designs you're doing, you will be going in all different directions. So you need to get comfortable with your hand being in different positions for sure. But yeah, maybe don't cross hatch in the very beginning. But I mean, who am I to say? You, you may cross hatch and, and absolutely love it and be proficient at it in 10 minutes. So I would never say no, don't do that one first. Yeah. Bobby's asking about starts and stops with ruler work and um, the locking of stitches and the transition between areas. I sneak in the ditch if I can. Um, like when I'm doing this, I would never do this and do one line and stop and then go break my thread and go and start again. I just sneak around in the ditch. You can travel in there um, and you should be fine. You can there's lots of different ways for starting and stopping it depends on i mean personally i'm not a um i'm not a show quilter or a competitive quilter i don't enter my my work into anything so i don't have to be as worried about the show quilters they're not allowed to show any so stops and starts and like everything's got to be you know clean and perfect um, you can either take just a couple of tiny stitches you know like one thread width apart maybe five or six. Um, I swing my thread underneath and then I tie and bury. I know you can technically cut it off and go, but I've tied and buried since 2006 when I started and I just can't get myself out of that habit. So I use a self-threading needle um, and I'll pop the threads into the self-threading needle and I put them in the right where the last stitch was for about an inch and bring them up and then cut them off. But yeah, sneak in the ditch if you can. Or if you're going around applique, you do your ditch work and then you go around your applique and then you start your, um, you start your filler design or your, don't get too, that's, never mind. That's another video. Um, you can sneak in the, you know, you can sneak around an applique to get to another spot, that kind of thing. Oh. Lydia said you can only see half my face. So maybe I'll get rid of this for a second. I don't know how to get rid of it. Just a minute. Solo. There we go. Can they see my whole face now? <laughs> Sorry. I didn't know what you could see or what you couldn't. Um, we do have a few questions about uh, Stitch in the Ditch uh, from Sue and Bobby. And, um, okay for tips uh, when the piecing isn't the best or when the top is never perfectly square. Do you have any tips? You follow the ditch. So if that, oh, and I don't know if I mentioned it. When you are stitching in the ditch, the ditch where you're stitching is the low side, right? So you've got your, your piecing like this and your seam is pressed that way. So you've got a high side and a low side. The ditch is that lower one there. What? Can they not hear me? Oh, okay. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> this is getting so stressful. You can only see half my face. You can't hear me. I should go back to stitching. Um, what was the last question? I'm sorry now. Um, just tips for stitching. Oh, right. Stitching in the ditch. Yeah. So you're always going to stitch in the low side. Now, as, as a quilter who quilts for other people, you may find sometimes that when you're stitching in the ditch, your seam is flipped. So there's always going to be that transition of you're stitching in the low side here and everything's going fine and all of a sudden their, their seam is flipped the other way. You just have to get back onto the low side. Um, I, just, I follow the piecing and if the piecing is a little off, I mean, you try, you want, it, you want to make it square, but you can only do so much. So I would rather stay in the ditch then come out of the ditch because my ruler's straight because then I'm not actually in the ditch anymore. Does that make sense? Um, so just follow the piecing, basically. Yeah. Ellen wants to 
wants to know what your margin is of lines with. Oh, my the crosshairs? Uh, the Bowen chalk pencil. It's um I I love this thing. It's chalk, it comes with a whole bunch of these and they just they fit in there. It comes with a um a pencil sharpener and you can sharpen that you can sharpen the chalk and you can get it nice and sharp so it'll give you a nice thin line. Um, I like it. I've been using this thing for years. Don't use the colored ones though. Some of these come with, uh, they come with a bunch of white ones and then they'll come with a bunch of colored ones. I don't trust the colored ones on my quilt top. If you're dressmaking or making jackets or bags or whatever and you want to use those colors to mark somewhere where when you're sewing it's not going to be like, it's not going to be seen. Uh, then go ahead, but I only use the white one, only the white one, because I know it's going to come out. It just rubs off. It rubs out really nicely. And I also use pounce and stencils, so yeah. Okay, so shall we, we, we should, uh, well, let's move to, um, let's move to a curve. I've got these curved lines here. The curves are pretty much the same as a straight ruler, except you just have to remember to um, adjust the angle that you're pushing the machine against the ruler, right? So that you, you want to hug it, basically. So when my students are here, we start with a straight ruler, then we move to a curved ruler, and then we go to the circle, okay? They're, they come in all different sizes, and generally, they are the same size, or they are the same curve on the inside as they are on the outside. For those of you who are going to ask, because I know you will, this is um, the QP curve by Linda Herka at the Quilted Pineapple. She has um, a line of rulers. They're beautiful. Uh, I love them. And they come in lots of different sizes. So unlike a straight ruler where honestly a small straight one and a large straight one are going to do you just fine forever if you're going to do curved ruler work you are going to need different sizes because the size of the curve the space that you're quilting is going to determine the size of the curve right we obviously with this can't we can't do any curved quilting on a two inch block with a curve this big we're going to need probably, this is probably going to be too big too, but you know what I mean? So the tighter the curve, the smaller the block. So you will want like lots of sizes of these. The inside curve and the outside curve, for the most part, in my experience with all the ones I've had, is the same inside and outside. So we're going to be able to actually just flip them so that our hands are comfortable. So I'll show you that. Lydia is frantically writing down questions that people have. And I'll also show you this one. This one is a tiny, this is a two inch curve. This is a three inch curve. And we've got the inside and the outside of both. So this, and it's also got a straight edge. So this little ruler is awesome for when you wanna do those continuous curves um, or small, uh, like a, the pumpkin seed, like maybe in a sashing, like in a cornerstone or something where it's a small area. That's what that's gonna be perfect for. So because this square is larger, and I'm gonna switch cameras. There we go. I think that one, they'll be able to see that one better. Yeah. I'm not gonna do anything sort of thrilling here. I just want you to see, we're gonna start maybe, maybe we'll just start here. So I've got, there's a straight edge on this. That's not a straight edge, silly goose. That's my vinyl. I thought it was a, I thought it was a mark on the ruler. <laughs> oh dear. All right. Well, you know, live TV and all that stuff. So I'm just going to drop my ruler down somewhere. I just want you to see. Same thing. I've got control of the curve the entire time. 
and I'm going to drag my machine around the curve. Let's do a half an inch with this one. So I'm going to push the foot with my ruler till my um, increment line is sitting on my stitching. Same thing here, I'm sneaking in my ditch like that and I'm going to drag it across. Now this ruler is actually going to be big enough to make it all the way across this little block. If the ruler's not big enough, like this one, this one's too small and if you see as I go up, this curve won't make it from point to point. So we need to use a larger ruler to make that work. And I would just continue on. So if I'm cross-hatching, doing a curved cross-hatch, this is exactly the same process as I just did with the straight ruler, except now we're curving it around a curve. Okay? And then I would finish the whole block. I would have started down here, but I'd finish the whole block, and then I would turn myself around, and I would come back this way, and we'd get a really pretty curved cross-hatching. Okay? Now, I want to show you the easiest way to hang on to a circle so that you don't end up in an awkward position and you don't have to move your hands. I'm going to switch to this one, I think. This one. Here we go. Hopefully everybody can see. So I've got my X marked in the middle of my block. That gives me the very center point of my block. And this works no matter what size your block is or how big or small your circle is, okay? I'm going to plop the very center of my circle right on that crosshair. And now I know that my, my circle's right in the middle, okay? If you hold the ruler with your left hand, you're going to start your circle at about 7.30. If you hold the ruler with your right hand, you're going to start your circle around 5.30 over here, and it's going to be one smooth movement, okay? So I've got my circle there. I've got that oat of sticky stuff on there, so it's not moving anywhere. Gotta love that. And then I'll come down to about 7.30, drop my needle down, bring my bobbin thread up, lock my thread, Make sure my ruler is positioned properly. And then I'm going to hold, I hold it again with my fingertips. My hand is up. It's a little awkward, but it's only awkward for a minute, okay? Or for a few seconds. Now, as I go around this, I've got some pressure on my ruler. You have to remember to hug the circle. As you're going backwards, we're going backwards, but we're coming to the right. As, we're, as we round this corner, we've got to start pulling the machine towards us. Generally, where people kind of lose their circle, as they come around here and they come around this corner, they kind of fall off the circle. So you just want to remember that you need to hug it the whole way. Okay, so I'm going to start there. My fingers are nice and close to the outside edge of the circle. And I'm going to go backwards and I'm going to hug that ruler the whole time. I'm going clockwise. As I come, I'm pulling it. I can shift my hand without having to take my hand off. And I am bang on right over top of the beginning stitches. And it's a perfect circle. And that will work every time. you can see it yeah nailed it right there okay so it helps if your ruler is actually um, gripping the fabric then you don't have to worry about it sliding but if you start that way you really don't you don't have to lift your hand and switch hands and all that kind of stuff you just have to be 
a little awkward for a minute. And then when you get around here, just sort of swing your hand around that way and your foot will tuck right up into there. Any questions? Okay, go ahead. Um, your chalk, uh, Donna asked about the pounce powder bouncing off the quilt. How tight is your backing fabric? Um, if we're, I'm going to, I actually have pounce here, so I'm going to use that. Just give me one second. I'm going to advance this forward. When you're stitching on your on your quilt, and it, oh oh, hang on one second. Can you grab that? We're going to lose. It got caught on the dowel there. Just unplug it, and we don't have to worry about it. Good grief! Yeah, <laughs> thank you. We almost blew a camera. There we go. All right. I have a couple of stencils here. I'm a big fan of registration line stencils. Um, and I actually tried that Odif stuff on the backs of these, and it, it helps. It, it, they don't move. They don't shift as much. I like it. So when I use them, this one is one inch increments, and I, I love this one for borders. All right? I will, we're going to do in another live, we're going to do marking and all that kind of stuff, and we can talk about that more in depth then. Um, but when I'm marking a border, I like my, I like my one inch uh, stencil and my pounce powder. So I, I like these when they get old. I have a really old one, old ratty one here, and do you think I can find it? So I actually tried to rough this one up um, so it like wears in. I think it, I, I like the way it disperses the chalk better, but give it a bang. And then we're just gonna hold that down and we're going to swipe it. Okay. So I need you to loosen off. I need you to loosen off your backing fabric. If you're quilting and your quilt sandwich is vibrating, this is way too tight. All right. What you're looking for, I really hope you can see this on camera. So I'm going to jack this. So there. Okay. So as I'm moving my machine around, we can't see the machine moving here, can we? And if I started to stitch, this, this would start to vibrate. So you need to back off your backing. And what we're looking for is enough give, not so that it's like loose, really loose, and you're going to end up with um, tucks and puckers or anything, but you want the back soft enough First of all, to allow the needle to flex as we move the machine around, the needle needs to be able to flex a little bit. I like to make sure that it's sort of like, think of a little mole under the snow. So as I'm moving that around, can you see, now my, my uh, ruler base is on there, but you can see it's just, just lifting the fabric a little bit. It won't vibrate now when I'm quilting. So for your chalk purposes, it shouldn't bounce the chalk off. Um, but I'm more concerned about your, your tension and your flex issue and your stitch quality with your backing um, that tight, okay? So just let it off just a little bit so you've got a little bit of give here. We don't want drum tight at all, especially if you float your tops, okay? I know it's totally off topic, but if you've got your backing super, super tight and then your batting is hanging and your quilt top is hanging and you quilt it that way, when you take your quilt off the frame and your backing fabric relaxes, 
it can actually pull the quilt top to the back and distort the shape of it because it's going to give when it comes off the frame, right? So you want to make sure that you're quilting with it with, with some give to it. Does that help? Okay, next question. Uh, Brenda, we can just answer questions. Brenda and Don, um, or Brenda, uh, what pen do you use to remove the blue water solvable marks? I use water. You talking about the, the, um, the well, I sell the curing one. That's my favorite one. Um, I just use water. Yep. I have these cool little pens here that you fill with water, and it's like a, like a felt tip. And if it's, if it's a line, I just run the, instead of spraying the whole fabric everywhere, I just take the pen, and I run the pen along where the blue line was, and it's just got water in it, and it takes it out. It's good. Works good. I forgot I'm supposed to repeat the questions so they can hear them. Sorry, guys. You had a question way at the beginning from Denise, um, and she asked, do you increase stitches per inch? I think that was when you were doing the ruler work. Oh, um, I, like, uh, I like 10 or 11 stitches per inch. Well, no, between 10 and 12 um, for ruler work. I don't, I don't increase my stitches much. Um, I don't like tight stitches, especially if you have to unquilt it. I don't want really tight stitches. Um, we are going to talk about stitch length. Uh, we're going to do um, we're going to do a night where we talk about threads, different kinds of threads, uh, what we want from them, what we expect from them, what looks best with them, what they're used for, and we will talk about stitch length then as well. But no, I don't increase my stitches per inch for any ruler work. I like to see my stitches. Thread looks pretty. Do you have the pens for sale? Somebody said, do I have the pens for sale? The Keering, I have the Keering blue water soluble markers on my website, yeah. They're my favorite. I've been using them for years. You can do a nice long line, like queen size quilt long line, and it's still giving you, it's still giving you marker when you get to the other end. It doesn't dry out halfway through. They're really good. I like them. Is that it for questions? Okay, cool. So let's do something else. All right. Actually, what we should do, let me get my thing here, and we'll go through some pictures of some. Okay, so here we've got stitching in the ditch. See, it's on the low side, and I've used a light weight thread for that. Okay, I think I'm going to do this. There we go. No, we'll just take me out of the equation because you can't, oh, you can only see half of me anyways. I will figure this out eventually, guys. There we go. All right, so stitching in the ditch is done first. That stabilizes the blocks and keeps everything where it belongs, and it will make your custom quilting look much crisper, okay? Again, I use a lightweight thread when I stitch in the ditch. So this block, everything was ditched first, and then I went in and did my, and did my ruler work. Here's some straight line, just in the sashing. And that's just a matter of up and down, up and down. It's kind of just like a diamond with a little quarter inch, a quarter inch echo in the corners. We'll do, um, we'll do another ruler one where it gets a little more involved, where I can show you how to echo, you know, echo one point, but not the other point, if that makes any sense. Instead of a solid echo, we can play with um, shapes. This one, it was used, used a small curved ruler, and I basically marked it, I marked the center, and then I marked my increment lines, and I just did these little pumpkin seed curves. This one here, the sashing at the top there, if you see that curved, the curved work, and then I did the filler inside it, all I did was uh, separate that sashing into three segments, 
and I used a gentle curve and I just did like a soft scallop and echoed it a quarter of an inch. I snuck Bobby, I snuck in the ditch to get to the other side of the sashing. So it was all done in the same, in the same go. All right. This one's cute. This one I used um, my square grid and I just pounced out some squares. And then I did my outside square and did a quarter of an inch echo. And then inside there, I went a half an inch in, just like I showed you on the first block, and then another quarter inch in. And then I did that little circle in the middle and um, the little yin yang, the little S, and those two tiny little circles were just freehand. Here's an example of playing with straight rulers and circle rulers and some heavy duty filler. I'm serious, guys. Once you learn the basics and the safety with rulers and you've got control of them and you know how to hold them and you understand the relationship with where you want to go as to where you hold the ruler, the sky is the limit, honestly. You can have so much fun and just get so creative with all this stuff. None of this was planned. I started doing those um, chevron triangle looking things and then I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll do another one and oh, well, that little circle will fit in there. And it just sort of evolved and became its thing. There's a little bit of fun there. That's uh, four sizes of circles with a square stuck in the middle. It makes no sense, but it looks kind of cool. And then I did that really tight um, that really tight matchstick quilting around it just to flatten everything else behind it. And then there's some more fun with some the same size circles, that little three inch circle. I just did a bunch of lines, straight lines with no, no rhyme or reason. I just did a couple of lines and then changed direction and did a couple of lines and then wherever that little circle would fit, I put the circle. That border, um, again, it's all one stop and one start. You work from side to side, back and forth, echoing as you go. And you can also use them to make space, spaces smaller. See that sashing at the top there? So the sashing was really big, but I wanted sort of a channel because the design I wanted to put in there I didn't really want it as big as the sashing was, but I also wanted it to be sort of blocked off so it really showed up. So I just did a couple of, um, a couple of straight lines with the ruler and got myself a channel and then did my little free motion thing in the, th in the side, or on the inside. Here's some curved cross hatching. So the curved cross hatching is done exactly the same as the straight cross hatching, except it's going on a curve. But what happens with anything that's curved tends to look more elegant or more formal, uh, to me anyway, rather than the straight lines. And then there's a bit of everything. I've got a couple of different size curves there to create the different lines. There's that little tiny um, circle in the middle of that feather wreath and then a little tiny cross hatch inside that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Sue was asking, hey, Sue. Uh, would you recommend stitching the ditch the entire quilt and then go back to do the ruler work? I'm a fan of stitching in the ditch first. Every scenario is different. If you have a plan, I never have a plan. That's my problem. Um, you can do the ditch work and the ruler work, providing it's just the bones. Does that make sense? We want to start with the large things. The stitch in the ditch puts everything where it belongs, makes it nice and crisp, and keeps it where it needs to be. With, um, let me see, with this quilt here, I actually did my ditch work and my ruler work at the same time in most of the blocks because the ruler work was very light and it wasn't going to draw the quilt in. 
too much, if that makes sense. Um, you want to start big and get smaller and smaller and smaller. So I like to start with the ditch work, and I will do the ruler work as long as it's not dense, and I will work my way through the whole quilt. Then I go back and block by block I put my motifs in. This also gives you the chance to change thread colors and do all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'll work through with all my motifs and then I go back and I do my, my sort of fillers, background fillers. And then the very last thing I do would be any micro quilting, micro fillers or scribble stitching or anything that's really, really heavy. Um, that's, I do very last. Because every time we're, everything we quilt, it starts to draw the quilt in just a little bit. So you don't want to just stitch in a ditch around a block, then do your ruler work, then your motif, then your filler, then you're in that one block, because it's going to start to distort things and pull everything in. Okay? Um, Bobby's asking, does heavy quilting or dense quilting make the quilt warmer, heavier, or how does it change the quilt? That's a good question, Bobby. Bobby asked about the density of the quilting um, in relationship to the warmth or the stiffness um, and all that kind of stuff. So the heavier you quilt a quilt, the less warm it's going to be because you're actually quilting the air out of the batting. Does that make sense? The more thread that's in there, the less air is in there and the air is what keeps us warm. So none, none of my quilts are warm ever because I always put too much thread in them. Um, but when you're, depending on what you're quilting and where you're quilting it, you're going to change the weight of your thread as well, right? So like I said earlier, if I'm ditch stitching, maximum is going to be a 50 weight, like so fine thread. I prefer 60, 80, and 100 weight for um, stitching in the ditch. 100 weight only if it's a wall hanging. 80 weight only if it's a wall hanging as well because it's it's so fine that I, I wouldn't put that in a bed quilt. Um, but the more the more and the heavier you quilt it, the less warm it's going to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kate is asking when changing colors, do you change both the top and and the, the bobbin? bobbin? Kate's asking if when I change colors, I change the bobbin thread when I change the top thread. Uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, I would have said absolutely. I used to change, every time I changed the top thread, I changed the bottom thread. Um, my customers liked it because they were getting two quilts in one. So I got a lot of solid backs from my custom uh, quilting clients because they got both things. I don't do it anymore. Um, I've fallen in love with those magnetic pre-wound bobbins because I'm lazy and I don't want to always wind bobbins. Um, I tend to now match value. So if I'm using, um, say, a medium light thread on the top, I'll use a medium, a medium light thread on the bottom, depending on the color of the backing and the quilt top, which is a whole other discussion. I want to talk to you guys about um, choosing backings for quilt tops but we'll do that another day. So no, the answer is no, I don't. I don't change my thread all the time anymore. I did though for a long time. That's good. That's good. Okay. Oh, the time went by fast. I didn't even show you that little border. I'll show you the, the I was gonna do a little border today too, but I think, um, I think we're good and we'll do that another day. Did anybody learn anything new? I hope so. I hope it was worth the time that you sat here with me. Are we good? Okay. If you have any questions after the fact, the live chat disappears. Found that out the hard way. Um, the live chat disappears, but the video will stay up there. So. Please, if you've got any uh, other questions or something comes up or more detailed questions or whatever, post them in there and I'll pay attention and I'll answer them as I see them um, properly and more in depth than we can do on the live feed. I don't mind. If I know the answer or I have a, a thought, I'll give it to you. doesn't mean it's right. It just means it's what it works for me. But, yeah. Okay. 
We good? Thanks, everyone. I hope Ruler Week was good, just the basics. We'll do some more complicated stuff another time, I promise. Um, but get those rulers out. Get your extended ruler bases first. No stitching without that. And uh, just play. Start with a small, straight ruler and just get comfortable. And then maybe move to, maybe, you know, move to a curve or whatever. And then get, get yourself some circles. And just play. You can be real creative with just those three. I know there's millions and millions of rulers on the market and they all do di they've all got different shapes and they all do different things. But honestly, if you've got a straight ruler, a couple of curves and some circles, you're good. You're golden. You can do all kinds of things with them. Okay? Thanks for coming, everybody. I appreciate it. I'll see you next Monday or in the chat, whichever comes